Number 1. Anatoly Moskvin loved history. He spoke 13 languages, traveled extensively, taught at the college level, and was a journalist in Nizhny Novgorod, Russia's fifth largest city. Moskvin was also a self-proclaimed expert on cemeteries and dubbed himself an acropolist. One colleague called his work priceless. Too bad Moskvin took his expertise to unhealthy new levels. In 2011, the historian was arrested after the bodies of 29 girls between the ages of 3 and 25 were found mummified in his apartment. As a young boy, Moskvin wandered through cemeteries. He stated in an article that his obsession with cemeteries and death started after an incident in 1979 when he was 13 years old. During the incident, some men dressed in all black stopped him on his way home from school. The men were on their way to the funeral of an 11-year-old girl. They dragged Moskvin to the cemetery and up to the coffin where they forced him to kiss her corpse. Moskvin wrote in the article, I kissed her once, then again, then again. Then the girl's mother placed a ring on Moskvin's finger and Alson on her daughter's finger. Moskvin went on to say that his marriage to the girl was useful and led to a belief in magic and a fascination with death. He claimed to have visited 752 cemeteries in the city of Nizhny Novgorod from 2005 to 2007. Moskvin took detailed notes on every grave he visited and looked into their history. He published a documentary series on his travels, and it continues to be published to newspapers. In 2009, people started to notice the graves of their loved ones were being desecrated, or in some cases completely dug up. The first theory was that this had been done by extremist groups. Police increased their presence at the graveyards. For two years the lead went nowhere, and graves continued to be desecrated. A break came in the case after a terrorist attack at the Domodedovo airport in 2011. Muslim graves were now being desecrated in Nizhny Novgorod. Investigators were led to a cemetery where pictures of dead Muslims were being painted over, but nothing else was damaged. On November 2, 2011, Moskvin was arrested by police investigating the Nizhny Novgorod grave desecrations. After apprehending Moskvin, eight police officers went to his apartment to gather evidence and found much more. 45-year-old Moskvin lived with his parents in a small apartment. Inside of the apartment, police found large life-size doll-like figures. The figures resembled antique dolls, they wore antique and different styles of clothing. Some of the figures wore knee-high boots, some had fabric covering their faces, and some had makeup on. Their hands were covered in fabric. When police moved one of the dolls, it played music. The police soon realized they were not dolls, they were mummified corpses. Moskvin had embedded music boxes in their chests. Police found noise boxes and toys inside the dead girls to make noise when Moskvin would touch them. Placed around the apartment were pictures of gravestones, plaques taken from gravestones, doll-making manuals, and maps of local cemeteries. Also found in the apartment were personal belongings from the girls. One of the girls had the hospital tag with her cause of death inside of her and another girl had a dried up heart inside of her. Police also found the clothes that the girls had been buried in. Moskvin admitted to police that he would stuff the decayed corpses with rags. Then he would wrap nylon tights around their faces or fashion doll faces onto the corpses. Moskvin would insert buttons or toy eyes into the girls' eye sockets so that they could watch cartoons with him. He also celebrated their birthdays. Moskvin said he loved most of his girls, but there were a few that he grew to dislike and stored them in the garage. He said the reason he dug up the girls was because he was lonely. Moskvin went on to explain that he wanted children more than anything, but Russian adoption agencies would not let him adopt because he did not make enough money. Moskvin also stated he was waiting for science to come up with a way to bring dead people back to life. He used a solution of baking soda and salt to preserve them. Also found in the apartment were shoes that matched the shoe prints found near the desecrated graves. Authorities found a total of 29 dolls in the apartment. One of the corpses had been there for nine years. Even though they also lived in the apartment, Moskvin's parents claimed to know nothing about the origin of his dolls. His mother said they saw the dolls, but never suspected that they were dead bodies. 
She thought that doll making was his hobby, and she didn't see anything wrong with it. Moskvin was charged with a dozen crimes, all that were related to the desecration of graves. The Russian media call Moskvin, the Lord of the Mummies, and the Perfumer, after Patrick Suskind's novel Perfume. Neighbors said Moskvin was quiet, and his parents were very nice. They did report that sometimes, there would be a foul odor when they opened the door, but they said it stinks of something rotten in the basement, which happens in some of the buildings around Russia. In court, Moskvin confessed to 44 counts of abusing graves and dead bodies. He said to the victim's parents, you abandoned your girls, I brought them home, and warmed them up. Moskvin was diagnosed with schizophrenia, and sentenced to psychiatric hospital. In 2018, doctors stated that Moskvin was no longer dangerous, and petitioned to release him for outpatient care at home. However, in February 2019, a psychiatric evaluation found it was too early to release him. In an interview after his arrest, Moskvin stated he felt great sympathy for the dead children and thought they could be brought back to life by either science or black magic. Number 2 there are still two aspects of this case, the act of search and the investigation, said Tennessee Bureau of Investigation Public Information Officer Leslie Earhart. Earhart said authorities are working around the clock to determine what happened to Wells. In order to preserve the integrity of the investigation, we can discuss everything we are doing and have done to find Summer, said Earhart. Despite all efforts in the investigation, Earhart said the circumstances leading to Summer's disappearance remain unclear. While every case is different, this one is definitely outside of the norm. There have been 106 agencies involved in search efforts from Tennessee, Ohio, Virginia, Alabama, Georgia, and North Carolina. Crews have covered over 3,000 acres, roughly 4.6 square miles, so far since the search began for Summer Moon Utah Wells last week. We will not quit until we find Summer Wells, said Incident Commander of Ground Search, Captain Tim Koo. Hawkins County Sheriff Ronnie Lawson stressed reaching out to officials with important information rather than relying on social media. I know there's a lot of social media posts going on out there, but they are absolutely useless unless these people that are 100% positive call 1-800-TBI-FIND, that means nothing. Earhart said officials are holding out hope, as they do everything they can, we typically would have found a child at this stage in the investigation, so honestly, we just don't know. She added the family continues to cooperate at this time. Earhart called the lack of answers after nine days of searching heartbreaking. We don't we still don't know where Summer is, we don't know what happened to her. And it's extremely frustrating. I can't tell you how heartbreaking it is, she said. We're doing everything we can to find her, but to not have any more answers than we do at this stage, it's just heartbreaking. As the search nears 10 days, Lawson said they won't give up. Everyone now is getting mentally, physically, emotionally, just drained. And we're going to rehab and start back again, but we're not going to stop. We're gonna find Summer. When asked about lie detector tests, Earhart said it's no secret that the TBI has a polygraph unit, but didn't discuss specifics. I can tell you that we use that as an investigative tool. In a situation like this, we're going to use every resource and tool available to us. Earlier this week Donald Wells, Summer's father, said that his wife, Candace Bly, has passed a lie detector test. Ku confirmed that people have reached out to officials about providing reward money for information leading to the discovery of Summer. The agency is working to get the account set up. He said they will provide more information on how the public could donate money to the account once the information is available. Summer Moon Utah Wells is three feet tall with blonde hair, who is believed to be barefoot. She was last seen Tuesday, June 15, walking near her home in the Beach Creek community wearing a pink shirt and gray shorts. On Wednesday, June 16, TBI issued an Amber Alert for Summer after initially issuing an endangered child alert the night she was reported missing. Since then, the agency said they have received over 300 tips, though none have resulted in a significant development in the case. TBI has told reporters they have not ruled out foul play in the disappearance of Summer Moon Utah Wells. 
Anyone with information on her whereabouts is asked to contact the Hawkins County Sheriff's Office at 423-272-7121 or the TBI at 800-TBI-FIND. Number 3. Alia was last seen in bed in her West in West Virginia home on September 24, 2011. She had been sick with flu-like symptoms, including vomiting, the previous evening. When her mother, Lena Maria Lunsford, went to check on her at 6.30 a.m., Alia was in bed asleep. The child's nine-year-old sister also saw her around that time. The next time her mother checked, at 9 a.m., she was gone. She has never been heard from again. Her mother didn't report her missing until 11.30 a.m., five hours after she was last seen, and two and a half hours after Lena realized she was gone. She said that in the interim, she drove around in her car looking for Alia, running out of gas at one point. There were no indications of forced entry to the house, and an extensive search of the area, including a nearby river, turned up no sign of the child. Alia's family described her as shy and said she would never have left her house or yard alone. Nine days following Alia's disappearance, her four siblings, aged between nine months and eleven years old, were removed from the household and placed in foster care. The State Department of Health and Human Resources didn't give a reason for the removal, but it's worth noting that all of Lena's children, including Alia, had previously spent time in foster homes or with relatives. Lena was pregnant with twin girls at the time Alia went missing, and the babies were taken from her after they were born. In the month following Alia's disappearance, Lena was arrested on federal charges of welfare fraud. She and her husband, Ralph Keith Lunsford, who is Alia's stepfather, both had prior criminal records for various charges for minor offenses. Lena's mother, who occasionally cared for Alia, died in early 2012. In February 2013, while Lena was in jail, she lost her parental rights to her other six children. Ralph, who is the father of five of the children, also had his parental rights terminated. Photographs of Lena and Ralph are posted, with this case summary. They divorced in the wake of Alia's disappearance. The court found that all the Lunsford children had been neglected, and some of them had irreversible tooth decay as a result. Court documents noted that Lena and Ralph had vaguely accused each other of involvement in Alia's disappearance. The court believed Lena knew more about her daughter's disappearance than she disclosed. Lena maintained she knows nothing about what happened to Alia and only hopes she's still alive. She was released from jail shortly after losing her parental rights, but later reincarcerated for a series of probation violations related to her welfare fraud conviction. Lena spent the next few years in and out of custody. She was jailed three times in the five years after Alia's disappearance. In November 2016, over five years after Alia's disappearance, Lena was arrested in her new residence of St. Petersburg, Florida, and charged with homicide by child abuse in her case. At Lena's trial in 2018, Ralph testified that they had taken bath salts the night their daughter disappeared, and he didn't know what happened to Alia. Two of Alia's older sisters testified against their mother. The girls, who have since been adopted by another family, were 9 and 11 years old when their sister disappeared. They said Lena had always treated Alia more severely than her siblings, and on September 23rd, she struck Alia in the head with a wooden bed slat. Alia's head was squishy and swollen after she was struck, and about 12 hours later her sisters found her unresponsive in bed. Lena attempted to revive her, but didn't call 911 or otherwise try to get help. She then put the child in a laundry hamper, put the hamper in the family car, and took it, Alia's sisters and her infant brother, to a wooded area known as Vadis. This was in a rural area of the county, off a dirt road without road signs. The younger sister stayed in the family vehicle, with the baby, while the older sister went with Lena, who was carrying the hamper with Alia's body. Eventually Lena told the girl to stop and sit down and left with the hamper. She came back without it and they all went home. Lena told her daughters not to tell anyone and threatened them, saying she had brought them into the world and could take them out of it. They kept their secret for five years. Lena's defense argued that the girls were lying and suggested Alia was still alive and might have been been sold for heroin. 
A restaurant manager from Louisiana testified for the defense, saying she thought she saw Elia with a man at a restaurant in November 2017. The defense also suggested that if Elia was dead, she might have died of an accidental overdose of flu medicine. Lena was convicted of all counts in April 2018. Murder of a child by refusal or failure to provide necessities, guilty of death of a child by child abuse, child abuse resulting in injury, and concealment of a deceased human body. She was sentenced to life in prison, without parole for the murder, plus 40 years for the other charges, to be served consecutively. Elie's body has yet to be located, searches of the Vadis area turned up, no evidence as to her whereabouts. Authorities believe the child's body was buried in a shallow grave, in a ravine which floods frequently, and that no trace of it may be left now. Foul play is suspected in her disappearance due to the circumstances involved. Number 4. On July 18, 1944, nine-year-old Richard Marlowe was riding his bike in front of the family home in Etobicoke, Ontario, Canada. His brother was watching him from inside the house. His family went to the movies. Richard decided to stay home with his older brother because he went the night before. Then he has never been seen again his bike still at the home. It's believed that someone abducted Richard. He came from a good home and really had no reason to run away. He was also known as a kid who was at school bright and early and was a shy kid. He never would talk to strangers or go into a dark room making it seem unlikely he would run away on his own. An extensive search was conducted for Richard. His father came home from the military to help. Police and militia were involved in the search, scouring the Etobicoke Creek, never finding any evidence. Psychics offered to help the family, for a cost too steep for them to afford. Over the next couple of years, various sightings of Richard would be reported from coast to coast in Canada and the United States. His parents would visit the morgue whenever an unidentified body was found, hoping to at least identify their son. They never did. Over the years Richard's family continued to search for answers as to what happened that fateful February evening. Gertrude continued searching for her son for the rest of her life, contacting police agencies and even the FBI for help and sent out flyers with her son's face hoping for some kind of lead in the case. However, their efforts were unsuccessful, and no new clues about Richard's whereabouts appeared. Regardless, every Christmas the family would place a gift for Richard, under the tree and light a candle, in their window for him, hoping one day he would come home. Gertrude Marlowe died ten years after her son's disappearance at the age of 56. John Marlowe died at the age of 80 in 1973. As of August 2019, none of Richard's siblings were alive. Thankfully, before this Toronto police had gathered DNA samples for the National Center for Missing Persons and Unidentified Remains. Although decades have passed and his immediate family has passed on, the nieces and nephews Richard never met continue to search for him today. After retiring from the University of Toronto, Gail Dykeman, the daughter of Richard's only sister Aileen, took the reins in the search for her uncle. After reading about the Ops Missing Persons and Unidentified Bodies Unit, she spent hours sifting through the online database searching for clues. She eventually entered his case into missingkids.ca, along with the Op Missing Persons database. Despite being the oldest missing person case in Ontario, the search for Richard Marlowe continues. According to caseworker Jessica Husick, the search has been focused on senior citizens. The Toronto police have released a video of Richard and his family, hoping it may help to spark some long-forgotten memory. If you have any information about the disappearance of Richard Marlowe, please contact the Toronto Police Service at 416-8080-2222 or call 1-800-66-KID-TIPS-543-8477. Number 5. In 1910, 38-year-old Connerty Noelson boarded a train in Brookfield, Wisconsin. She told her four children, who had come to the station to see her off, that she was going to a doctor's appointment in Milwaukee and would return the next day. Sadly, she never came back and was never seen again. For the rest of his life, her eldest son, Edwin, blamed himself for not accompanying her. 
In 1983, over 70 years later, Edwin's daughter, Geneva, began genealogical research into her family's history. She learned that in 1891, Conradina, then 20, married 30-year-old Carlo Olson, a railroad coachman. By all accounts, their marriage was not a happy one. Although Geneva could find no evidence that Carl was physically abusive, she learned that he was emotionally and verbally abusive to Conradina. Unfortunately, due to the time period, she could not get a divorce. At first, Geneva believed that she had ran away to escape an abusive marriage. However, Geneva's beliefs changed in September 1985, when she was working at a gift shop in South Dakota. A customer named Susanna Stickney told her that she was a psychic. She claimed that she knew Geneva wanted to ask her about Conradina. She asked if she had any of Conradina's possessions, so she gave Susanna a picture of her, along with her marriage certificate. She flipped them over and claimed that she had visions of a woman boarding a train, children crying, and a fight between a man and woman near a railroad track. She also claimed that Carl knew what happened to Conradina. Later, at Susanna's office, Geneva was given more clues about Conradina's disappearance. Susanna told her that in a few weeks, she would receive several letters in the mail. In them, she would be able to determine the year that Conradina went missing. Susanna also claimed that Ellis had something to do with her disappearance and that she was buried in an unmarked grave. Surprisingly, just a few weeks later, Susanna's first prediction seemed to come true. Geneva received several letters and photographs from the late 1800s and early 1900s. These, sent by Conradina's nieces and nephews, stated that there were troubles in the marriage and that the last time she was heard from was around 1910. Geneva sent a letter to a Midwestern newspaper describing her search. A man named Bill Carpenter read the newspaper and contacted Geneva. He told her about an unmarked grave near railroad tracks in Ellis, Missouri. According to local legend, a fashionably dressed woman got off of a train there. She was seen arguing with a man. Witnesses reported that it appeared to be a lover's quarrel. They were seen walking eastward along the tracks. Later, the man was seen returning to the station alone. He boarded another train and left town. Three days later, the woman's body was discovered alongside the tracks. She had been shot through the heart. Nothing was found on her to identify her. According to the legend, railroad workers buried her nearby. As a result of the story, Geneva became convinced that Susanna was right and that the woman in Ellis was Conradina. Despite her belief, however, it appears impossible that that was her. A historian found an 1888 newspaper article which stated that she was found on April 21, 1877. Conradina vanished around 1910. Furthermore, she was described as being less than 20 years old, while Conradina was 38 when she vanished. Geneva believes Carl killed Conradina or was in some way involved in her disappearance. She learned from relatives that around the time of her disappearance, Carl also was gone for a period of time. Originally, however, she believed that Conradina disappeared voluntarily to escape an abusive marriage. Results Unresolved Although Conradina could not possibly be the identity of the woman buried in Ellis, both the true fate of her and the true identity of the woman buried in Ellis remain a mystery. An 1888 article states that the unknown woman was named Lula King, but this claim has not yet been confirmed. Conradina's great-grandchildren and other relatives later uploaded their DNA to Ancestry.com and other websites. However, they have been unable to find any further trace of her. Number 6. Anderson was employed as a legal secretary at the law offices of James Rabbit and J. Feldstein on East Manhattan Boulevard in Toledo, Ohio in 1981. She was last seen at the business on August 4 of that year. Her employers discovered that the radio was turned on and their desks were prepared for the day upon their arrival at work. Unclaimed mail had been placed inside the front door handle and a romance novel Anderson was reading was opened on her desk. There was no sign of her elsewhere in the building. Her purse and car keys were missing, but her vehicle was locked in the parking lot outside of the office. She didn't leave a note on the door, which was her usual habit whenever she had to step out of the office during work hours. Anderson has never been seen again. 
she left a substantial amount of money behind in her bank account, and her social security number has not been used since her disappearance. Anderson had received suspicious phone calls at work in the weeks prior to her disappearance, which seemed to disturb her. Her family reported that she also suffered from recurring nightmares about being attacked by a man. Anderson's employers installed an emergency buzzer at her desk during the summer of 1981. She also kept the office's doors locked at all times. This was due to the harassing calls and ominous messages. There have been several suspects in Anderson's disappearance, none of which have been officially ruled out in her case by investigators. Anthony and Nathaniel Cook, two brothers convicted of nine murders in the Ohio area between them in the 1980s, have denied any involvement in Anderson's case. Another convicted murderer currently imprisoned in Ohio is thought to have possibly been involved in her disappearance as well, though any connection has never been established and the man has never been publicly identified. Convicted drug dealer Jose Rodriguez Jr. and his attorney, Richard Neller, are also suspects in Anderson's case. Neller worked with Anderson's law firm during 1981, and authorities theorize that she may have overheard conversations between Neller and Rodriguez concerning drug deals prior to her disappearance. Investigators believe the information may have led to Anderson's possible abduction and murder, though this has never been proven. An informant testified at Rodriguez's trial in 1995 that Rodriguez confessed to killing Anderson, but the testimony was ruled to be unreliable. Both Rodriguez and Neller are currently imprisoned due to drug convictions. No one has been charged in connection with Anderson's disappearance. Anderson is described as a devout Christian fundamentalist who enjoyed her job and family life in 1981. She had a boyfriend and many friends. Anderson was planning to quit her secretarial job two weeks after her disappearance in order to attend Bible college. Her family has stated it would be extremely uncharacteristic of her to vanish without explanation for her loved ones. Anderson's parents are both deceased, her mother died of cancer in 1983, and her father died in 2008. In her father's obituary, it was noted that Anderson preceded him in death. Her case remains unsolved.